Hello, my Socratica friends. We're here to help you be a great student. And an important part of being a great student is sharing what you've learned. And that means public speaking. Hmm. Did you know that public speaking is the number one phobia? People are more afraid of speaking in front of an audience than dying. I know it's completely irrational. Seriously, what's the worst that could happen? You get booed off the stage. They throw rotten tomatoes at you. Rationally, death is far more serious than making a speech. That's just it. Phobias aren't rational. It literally feels like your life is at stake. If you're afraid of public speaking, you can take some comfort in knowing you're not alone. Today, let's fight this fearsome foe. We will defeat the discussion demons. Pummel PowerPoint presentations into a pulp. Socratica friends, assemble your weapons of dissertation. Quick reminder, if you enjoy this type of practical advice from Socratica, please help us continue. Become our patron on Patreon. Every bit of support helps. If every viewer donated a dollar a month, I might be able to buy a new sweatshirt. First, consider what kind of presentation you're going to give. The most common types of presentations are roundtable discussions, panel discussions, and solo presentations, usually with slides. Each one of these will mean a different kind of work you need to do, both to prepare and when you are actually giving your presentation. Have you been asked to lead a roundtable? That means there will be give and take with all the participants. You won't be the only one in the hot seat. That should take a lot of the pressure off. Table discussions are one type of presentation you'll be asked to give once you start to specialize in school, studying in smaller groups. Roundtable presentations are also very common once you enter the workforce. For instance, you may be asked to present your team's progress on a certain project. Many science labs have journal clubs where the members take turns presenting research papers. For roundtable presentations, you should have a list of talking points prepared in advance. But remember, you shouldn't be the only one talking. Open the meeting with a quick overview of what you plan to cover and remind your audience that this is a group activity. If you're leading this presentation, part of your job is to facilitate discussion. Make it easier for people to participate by showing them you're listening to what they say. Your body language helps a lot here. Turn a little towards the speaker. Give them your attention. If people are still reluctant to speak up, tell them explicitly what kind of interaction you're looking for. For example, you can say, I'd like to hear what's the first thing that jumps to mind when you see the numbers in figure four, or who has a different interpretation of the results of this study? Keeping your audience involved will make the time fly by, not just for you, but for everyone participating. Are you going to appear on a panel? This is a common activity in a lot of jobs. Attending conferences and participating in panel discussions in front of an audience is a way to share your expertise. Again, the nice thing about taking part in a group discussion is that some of the pressure is taken off because you won't be expected to speak the entire time. Keep that in mind if you're nervous. You're all in this together. A few minutes chatting together before the official panel begins can go a long way towards fostering this sense of camaraderie. Most panel presentations will feature a moderator who will decide which topics to cover and call on participants to speak. If possible, the panelists should try to connect with the moderator ahead of time so they have a chance to prepare some remarks about the major talking points. I'm not saying you should go up there and read from a bunch of note cards. Just do a little background work so you don't show up completely unprepared. You should also devote a little extra time to think about what other topics could come up during discussion and points you might like to make. Panel presentations are a team effort, so be a good team player. Don't rely on the other panelists to carry you. Do your part to keep the discussion going. Answer the moderator's questions succinctly and leave time for your fellow panelists to speak as well. Make sure to stay engaged. Don't zone out when it's someone else's turn to talk. Give them the courtesy of actively listening to their points. What they say may influence your thoughts going forward. Panel discussions sometimes get out of hand with one person dominating the conversation. If the moderator is experienced, they will ensure that everyone has a chance to be heard. But if you see someone completely hogging the limelight, it doesn't hurt to jump in and say something like, I'd love to hear Jessica's thoughts on the subject because she led this related project last year. And finally, the biggest challenge of them all, a solo talk all by yourself. We're going to assume you're using a presentation program like PowerPoint or Google Slides. 
People complain a lot about PowerPoint, but we remember back in the day when you had to actually make slides, camera slides. It was a whole production. You had to take pictures with a camera and then go to a shop to have them developed. So you had to have all your slides finished like a week in advance. Not like now when you can keep tinkering with your slides right up to the time to do your presentation. Oh, and once you got your slides back, you had to load them into a carousel in the right orientation for the projector. And you had to be really careful not to jostle it or your slides would fall out and then they would be all out of order and upside down. I might have a few scars from the experience. We've really come a long way with technology. Presentation software like PowerPoint has proven to be both essential and easy to use badly. Let's talk about how to use these tools well to build a great talk. It all starts with an outline. Once you know the topic for your presentation, jot down the major ideas you'd like to share. Next, start putting them in order. How does one point logically follow from a previous point? What questions are raised and then how do you answer them? Think of it like a conversation where you supply both the questions and the answers in a way that someone listening can easily follow along. How many major points do you think you can make in a talk? We recommend aiming from 10 to 20. Now, we've seen talks with 50 slides, 100 slides. I'm sorry, that's just ridiculous. You may as well be watching an action film with a cut every three seconds. But how did we arrive at this 10 to 20 number? Consider how much time you have for your talk and then subtract five to 10 minutes or so to leave time for questions at the end. So if you have a 30 minute time slot for your presentation, you have 20 minutes to present. How many slides is that? 10 to 20, because you need generally one to two minutes at a minimum to do a slide or a topic justice. What goes on the slide? Here, right here, is where most presentations go off the rails. Slides are a visual aid. They are not a transcript of your talk. Keep the text to a minimum and pick a visual that captures your point. This can be literal, a graph, a table of data, or metaphorical with a photograph or illustration that lets the audience feel your point. The font needs to be very large. Aim for 30 point font as a minimum. Don't bother with bulleted lists. It's one of those default PowerPoint things that really are unnecessary. Write the one thing you want your audience to remember. It doesn't have to be a full sentence. When it comes time to present, you have a simple job. For every slide, explain what it means. Be careful and deliberate. This is especially important when presenting graphs. We've seen so many people slap up a graph and expect the audience to immediately know what it means. Walk your audience through this information. Start with reading the axis labels. Here, we have the concentration on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. Next, describe the trend in the data. Notice the initial high rate of reaction falling precipitously and then the long tail as the reaction gradually slows down. Finally, state what you conclude from this graph. We conclude that this is a second order process. Should you memorize your speech? No, please don't do this. If you really know your stuff, you should be able to deliver the information naturally. By all means, write down the facts you must get exactly right, but then say them in your own words. That's why writing the key fact on the slide is so helpful. You don't want to write a full sentence on the slide, but if you have something like 75% of clients aged 55 and over on a slide, you can say that any number of ways. Remember, teachers know this, there's a very real limit to how much information your audience can take in at one sitting. Don't feel like you have to tell them everything. Leave them wanting more. If by some miracle after you have carefully presented your 10 to 20 slides and you have more than 10 minutes left for questions, you can prepare one extra slide as food for thought, something that is peripheral and that you find interesting and would like to investigate in the future. But if you're out of time, stop. Don't go over time into the next speaker's time slot. That's just bad form. Socratica friends, has this dispelled some of your fears? We know that as curious thinking people, you're going to have valuable information to share with the world. We hope these tools help you find your voice. Next time you have to give a presentation, put these methods to the test and let us know how it goes. Sharing knowledge is an important part of being a great student. <laughs>